Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Uh, my name is Victor. I'll give a slight introduction in just a minute. Um, so yeah, we're going to get started right away. Uh, experiment management is just the beginning. That's the, the title of the talk. Um, the idea here is that I'm going to try and give you a no-nonsense guide to upgrading your workflow. Uh, some of these things you might already know, some of these you might not. Um, if there are any uh, that I forgot, for example, feel free to add them in the chat. Uh, I will take the questions at the end of the um, session, mainly because I want to respect everyone's time and not go too much uh, over if that would, if, if at all, obviously. Um, and obviously we are clear ML, uh, so there are also some memes, uh, so expect those as well. Right, so first of all, who am I? Um, I'm actually a developer advocate at ClearML. Uh, I've been four years, so I've, I'm pretty young, you can see it. Um, I don't have too much, like I'm not an industry veteran, but I have enough experience uh, in ML engineering to know uh, how painful it sometimes can be and how annoying it sometimes can be and what like the pain points are. Um, so that's why I joined ClearML, which is an open source MLOps company um, that essentially tries to alleviate a lot of these uh, problems. So I also make the YouTube videos that you will see on the ClearML YouTube channel. If you if you ever are there, um, feel free to give me a like. Uh, blog posts as well. And I love tinkering and making with ML as well. There is another channel called ML Maker that only has one video so far, uh, but it's just for entertainment purposes. So feel free to check that out as well. Uh, so this is the person that's sitting in front of you today, uh, and I hope to be able to teach you something. All right, so maybe let's start with um, MLOps. I told you I want the no-nonsense guide, right? So I want to demystify a little bit of the terms first, and then we'll also take a look at how it actually looks like, um, like in the code editor and um, in, in the console as well. Um, so MLOps in one image, back in 2014, Google released a very important paper called Hidden Technical Debt and Machine Learning Systems. And essentially they said, if you ever want to do something useful with your code, and that this includes like uh, research as well, um, you need to build a lot of stuff around it, right? So the ML code, the, the black square here, is only a very small part of what an ML system is like. And, and a very small part of the time you will invest into try and get everything working. And so mainly data collection, feature extraction, uh, data verification, things like that, as <laughs> configuration as well, if, you, if you're unlucky. Um, these are things that everyone using machine learning will already have run in against. And then there's stuff like analysis tools, process management tools, serving infrastructure that are more important for, say, companies. Uh, but actually, more likely, um, a lot of you are going to uh, run into that. So it just sounds like DevOps with extra straps, right, at that point. Uh, so that, that's why the, why the meme is there. So this is 2022. Um, there is the AI Infrastructure Alliance. Uh, ClearML is part of that as well. Um, the idea is that they try to map out how this system or these, this, these interconnected systems look like today um, and how the tools that are out there today actually map on that right so we're going to get yeah throw away a little bit of the 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 too muchness of this uh, because it can be quite overwhelming um so the main idea is here is that we have the data stage the training stage and the deployment stage and um, that's what i want to actually focus on today what are the tools in each of those stages that can help you in your daily life and and what do they do um, and why would you want them? So that's the main idea of today's talk. Um, feel free to check out the AI infrastructure lines as well. They have like different tools and they map them on these um, blueprints is what they're called. Right, so every machine learning engineer in, in the chat here um, has heard of this. Uh, so this is like the, the main machine learning cycle, right? The workflow. So you retrieve the data first, obviously, you clean and explore it, and then you prepare and transform it. That's all part of the data pre-processing stage or like the data processing stage. Actually, this takes by far the, the most time, as you probably know. Um, then we have the modeling phase, and then we have the deployment phase as well. And the reason that I put this here is because it's a nice color, uh, colorful diagram that we will be able to follow along with uh, during the talk so that you always know where we are at, at a certain moment. And then the, re the way that I'm going to try and do this talk, or at least show you the, the value of, um, of the tools that I'm talking about, is to have a sample use case, right? So just so we have something to talk about um, that is like real uh, and no nonsense, basically. So we are going to do auto classification today. Um, essentially, it's urban based on the urban sound data set. Uh, so this is like a data set with all kinds of sounds you might find in an urban environment like a city. Um, we will first get the data using getData.py. You'll see it in just a minute. Um, then we'll create a data set version using the data that we just got. Um, we'll also track everything using the experiment manager, which is the second part. And then the preprocessing.py will actually convert the audio files, the WAV files, to spectrum images. 
um, because if you have a spectrum, you can actually do nice computer vision techniques on there that allow you to classify uh, the audio very well um, without actually having to go into the audio itself. Um, that will create a new version because it will now include the spectrum images as well. And then we'll go into the training of Pi, which will actually train our model. The spectrum images, like I said, essentially you go from audio uh, to um, yeah, imagery uh, and then do the classification on the images uh, themselves. So that's just um, a bit of the background here. Um, and then the last distribution here. So what are the kind of things we would be uh, classifying? It's dog barking, children playing, air conditioners, stuff like that, right? So uh, you'll, you'll see these pop up in just a minute. Right, so if we go back to our uh, flow, you'll actually see this flow come back right here at the right top. Uh, so you always know where we are. Um, right, so the first stage is, of course, the data pre-processing stage. And that is actually what I will now call the data stage. And essentially, I want to, the first thing I want to, to mention is please split experiment tracking or code tracking and data versioning. Um, Git is not made for data versioning. Um, people tend to use it. If you're using tabular data, maybe, um, but if you're using anything else, it's not made for it. Even Git LFS has its issues. Um, so I'm going to try and convince you that, that what you need is actually a data um, versioning tool. And I'll also show you why they're uh, interesting for you. So first of all, versioning and lineage, right? Why do we want this? So a, a common case we see a lot uh, with, with people practicing on machine learning is that the data set is just a folder on a disk somewhere, right? It might just be um, the, the, the shared GPU machine in which case there might be a backup, but it also could be easily your laptop or, or any other machine of, of work that is not ideal. Um, and it hasn't, yeah, it doesn't have backups. It's, 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 yeah, you have to manage it yourself, basically. Um, you create a copy of the folder and then you remove bad samples or add some others, right? So imagine I want to create a new version of the data set. I can just copy paste the, the folder and then add stuff in there or like add new images or remove images. Uh, but what most likely will happen is we'll do it in the original folder, which is, again, not ideal. Um, because then over time, we, it starts to become a huge mess and you can't actually go back easily, especially with removed images, that might be uh, an, an issue. And I'm, I'm talking about images here, but it could be audio files or, or tabular uh, data, doesn't really matter. So where do these new samples come from? Which means that imagine if you uh, share your data set with like a colleague or, or your professor or uh, your boss or whatever, they don't know where this data came from, right? If if you work together with a lot of people, um, you also don't know where the data come from, comes from, right? So that's, that might be um, an issue as well, because you want to know wh wh where the data came from that you're actually working with. And then the script diffs are coupled uh, with the data as well. And this is a very important one. If you use anything like Git LFS or just a, a folder, what you don't have is a neat and easy way to add things like plots or tables, or descriptive tables or descriptive statistics to it, right? Because now you have this version, this data set version, you want actually extra information about that as well. Um, and that's what these kind of tools are trying to offer you. Um, then there is a second part. So we had data and lineage. Uh, sorry, we had data uh, history or versioning and lineage. The second thing that the, these tools try to address is accessibility. So usually uh, people that we talk to uh, tend to host a lot of things on Google Drive or very similar, um, which works, but it's not ideal. Um, you, it's, it has no inherent versioning system or no, no good one. Um, so yeah, you can't easily share it with different people. You always have to do the share thing. Um, so it's, it's not ideal. What is the latest version? Uh, you will probably call it full data boss and me final final v 5.2.zip, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not ideal, right? Um, and knowing to get the data to uh, a shared remote SSH machine. So if you're working on your local laptop and everything is in your folder, that's all nice and good, but how do you get it on the machine that you're actually training on, the one with the GPUs, right? So that also might be an annoying thing because yeah, Google Drive doesn't have the best uh, CLI interaction. So uh, I want to switch between running on a subset and uh, on, of the data versus the whole data set, for example. So that's another thing that might, um, yeah, be an interesting use case for uh, one of these tools. So these kind of tools actually were developed for for essentially this re these reasons. And, and what we saw is that there's a lot of people that try to make these things themselves, basically, uh, because people know that there is a, a need for it, um, but it tends to be difficult to, um, yeah, to actually uh, make it well. And that's why these tools exist. Uh, and just wanna show you what that might look like. So let's just go into the code real quick. 
Um, this is a quick overview. So getData.py is what we just said, we'll download the data from Urban Sound and then put it into a ClearML data set. In this case, I will be talking about ClearML, obviously, but there's a lot of other tools and I will go over that as well. Um, Preprocessing.py will actually take that data and then preprocess it, uh, basically convert the uh, audio into the images and then go from there and then train up and then put that into a new data set and then train.py will actually train on that, right? So what does what might that look like, right? So I just wanna show you, so build QML data set is what we're going to do. Um, essentially, we just get the Urban Sounds data set, which will give us a path to a CSV and a path to the actual audio, right? Uh, the CSV is basically the metadata. And so we want to take that metadata and uh, build it into a Pandas data frame, which we might do anyway, right? Um, and then the QML part starts. And this is, it's actually as simple as this, right? So we just create a data set, call it ODSC data set in this case, and uh, put it into a project, ODSC webinar, so that we have nice and neat projects that we can use for organization, right? Then you just add the files. So I had a path to the Urban the Sounds audio. I'll just add the files. It will recursively grab all of those uh, WAF files and add them to the data set. Then I can upload an artifact. In this case, I will upload the metadata, which is our Pandas data frame here. So you can just add any type of metadata, uh, any type of Pandas, sorry, any, any type of Pandas data frame, and will just be uploaded and added to the data set as well. And then we can add some statistics. Just like I said before, this can be very interesting. If you go and take a look at that uh, function here, um, we actually just report a table and report a histogram, right? So the histogram will just uh, give you a class distribution and the table will just say, this is the metadata, right? And now you will have a very nice, clean visual overview of what is in your data set. And what that might look like in the um, UI here is if we're going to the ODSC data set right here. So this is under data sets, ODSC data set. We can see here we added 111 files. If I go into details, you'll see all of the WAV files that were added. You can see their hashes. You actually have an automatic preview as well. Um, so there is obviously the. Um, a histogram that I added, right? So this is the neat thing about this. You can just click on the data set and see the hist see the, all of the data that you added there um, very easily. Um, and you can also just see the actual metadata. And then something that we didn't do, but QML did for us, is they added a bunch of um, audio samples here that we can just play from here. Um, you might actually not be able to hear this, but essentially you can, you can um, just have a nice quick overview of what happened. And then in the console, you'll be able to see um, all of the console output of that task, which might not be very interesting if nothing is going wrong, but if something is going wrong, this can help you quite out quite a bit. If I go back to the data, it can be very, very easy now, and that's the accessibility part, to get this data set. And essentially what we do here is we have a data set builder and a preprocessor. The data set builder will just get the data set using its project oh, and the data set name, and it will just get the latest version of that data set with that name in that project, right? You can also add tags and stuff like that. Um, it will get the metadata as well, and then it will get uh, the preprocessor and start preprocessing on that. Now it will turn all of that into images, uh, like here, like so, and then it will create a new data set with a tag called preprocessed. And this is actually a version that's based with the, as parent on the original data set. And what that means is that we've now created this lineage, right? So now we can add every uh, x iterations uh, or every x um, images we can add an image together with the audio we add the, we add all the files all of the raw files but also now all of the uh, image files and then we upload the metadata again now what that looks like is like this right so now we can see that it's actually based on the previous one and if we're going to go to content we see that every WAV file now has a corresponding npyy file which is basically the um, the image, right? The spectrogram. And then if you're going to preview, let's give it a moment to load, uh, we can actually have all of these um, images, all of the spectra together with the audio. So that's really, really handy, a really, really nice and easy overview um, of this uh, data set. So this is a really cool uh, ap application. Um, I might add that ClearML is fully open source and free. So all of this, you can just get started in just a minute. Right, so other tools that do this, uh, we're not the only ones, of course, so feel free to do your own to do your own research. GitLFS does it, but I would recommend against it because it's not ideal for this uh, type of application. But there are others like LakeFS, the, probably the best well-known is uh, the DVC, 
And then there's Pachyderm as well. So if you want to Google on these names, uh, feel free to do so. Right, so in the experiment stage, AKA how to make a mess, because every single data scientist knows that this is the stage where you make a mess. Um, if the pre-processing wasn't uh, already a mess, right? So first of all, what is experiment management? You have your code versioning, and I hope that I shouldn't be telling anyone here that you should be um, versioning your code with Git, right? I think most people agree on that. Um, and then you have your data versions as well. But what is what is an experiment? Now, an experiment is essentially a single run of your code with that data set version. And it's the code, but it's also parameters. It's also outputs that your code produces, which is different from Git in that it also captures all of these outputs every time. Um, plots, artifacts, model files, you name it. Um, console logs as well. Environment details, which will be a very, very important one. And then obviously the data set version ID that you used. So if you're using both the experiment manager and the data set version management, this is a very big boon because you know on which data set version was every single experiment trained. And you can always go back because you have the version history of the data set. Right, experimenting. Why would we want an experiment manager in the first place, right? So like I said, it's messy. There is no, it now works in data science. So essentially you have no commit trigger. Uh, you just try some things with new hyperparameters or new uh, like optimizers or whatever. You try it, it gives you an output number and God knows what that output number is, like how well it works. No one knows. Um, so you don't have this, now I have to commit. Now this feature is done, like in software engineering. There is not, no real um, comparable thing here. You can test multiple different approaches um, and how do they compare, right? So. They're difficult to compare if you're just putting everything uh, on your on your file um, on your in your file manager, right? So just on disk. Um, how are you going to compare? A lot of people use TensorBoard. That's a good start, um, and I'll, you'll see actually that we uh, work very well together with TensorBoard. Uh, but yeah, it's a good start. But there there can be a lot of things better. Um, file names become really bad. So v2 final, v2 whatever. Uh, even in TensorBoard, you have to like name the runs as well. People start to do either have the date so that at least something changes or uh, they have um, like all the hyperparameters in the name, which is also not ideal. Um, and then a colleague of mine, this is a cool story, a colleague of mine actually fixed this by making a Python class that he called at the bottom of every cell, of every notebook that he did in a cell. Um, and essentially what that, did, what that did is it zipped his whole root folder uh, together with all the plots or whatever, and then just stored it somewhere. And then all of those plots would be overwritten the next run and it would be zipped again. So essentially, like I said, a lot of people try to make this themselves, but it's not always as easy, is it? So that's why these tools uh, exist. And so experimenting the outputs is a big one, right? So this is what, what um, like there is it apart from something like Git is the outputs, is, is model files, is plots, is stuff like that, right? So code produces plots, performance metrics, model weights, you name it. All of these you want to track as well. Um, Git was never designed to track these, so it's just the wrong tool in this case. And file names are even harder. Forget label, forget the label access, for example, and then suddenly you don't know um, anymore what that plot is, right? So if you can go back to your original code and the, you have the plot together with your original code, that's really, really nice. Um, so even if neatly organized, no connection to the original code and the parameters exist. This basically means that imagine if I actually create a nice, neat new folder in which I put my plots every single run and do it myself. Even still, if I go back to the original plot two months later, I don't have the original code anymore. So I can't even reproduce anything anymore, right? So that, that kind of becomes quite hard uh, over time. So again, I will show you the world. Uh, it's a bit of, a, of an exaggeration, obviously, uh, but in this case, I just want to show you what these tools can do, right? So let me just collapse this. Um, essentially, all you need to do for ClearML to start tracking your experiments is just import the task object and then call task.initialize. Um, you give it a project name, you give it a task name. You don't even have to do that. It will just be untitled, but please give it a name. Uh, <laughs> and then these two are optional. So reuse last task ID is uh, if you want to be able to reuse the last task uh, to remove clutter um, if, if it's not completed correctly. Um, and then output URI will essentially save the models that are detected in, um, in the training room. Uh, actually, what is cool about ClearML specifically is that it integrates really nicely with tools like ArcParser. 
Uh, so all of these arguments will actually automatically be tracked by ClearML. I don't even have to add any other code, right? The initialize here will just take care of that for me. Um, so what I will then do is make a ClearML data loader, which will essentially just get my data set and turn it into a PyTorch data loader, um, which I can then use to actually train the model on. So this will essentially grab the latest version of my pre-processed data set from just before, right? Um, Right, then we create a both, uh, both the loaders, we uh, load in the model and stuff like that, right? So, and we also make a TensorBoard writer, a TensorBoard uh, writer, right? So the cool thing, again, about ClearML is it tries to hook into as many of these libraries as possible. So if you're using TensorBoard, if you're using Matplotlib, if you're using ArcParser, PyTorch, Tensor, TensorFlow, stuff like that, it will all hook into that and actually already track everything that you do based on what you add to these um, um, libraries, right? So if you, for example, generate a Matplotlib plot, it will already be added to the plot section with ClearML because we've already essentially detected that you're using that. So you don't even have to add a single line to your code apart from the details in it if you're using these uh, libraries. So what we end up doing is we train the model for a number of epochs, um, and then we essentially, in the training, we just write to the TensorBoard. That's all we do. There is no ClearML specific code anywhere in here. Um, and then if we're going to the experiment manager here, we have the ODSC webinar. This is what it looks like, right? So we have our source code tracked automatically just using the test of init. Uh, it has a repository, but also it has the commit uncommitted changes. Like I said, we have no commit trigger. So that's exactly what we want to do. Um, all installed packages are tracked as well. So you can always reproduce everything. And I'll show you that in just a minute. Um, there is configurations. So uh, like I said, the the arc parser automatically detects these are my arguments. So we'll just put them in an args section in hyperparameters and uh, you will be able to see those as well. Uh, artifacts, so saved models will all be here. Um, info is just when it was run and stuff like that. Console output, uh, scalers, very interesting. These are the kind of things that you would add to TensorBoard. But if you don't use TensorBoard, if you don't want to use it, obviously you can just do it with one line in ClearML as well and manually add your scalers. Um, in plots, we don't have any in this uh, specific example. And in debug samples, we have the uh, images that I just gave a name labeled dog bark, predicted siren, um, so that we can just debug really nicely. So this is what it would look like. Um, if I just select two of those, I hope they're actually different. I didn't check. Um, we can actually just compare them, right? Just like I said before, uh, which we want to do. So we can just see when they were run, but also the, the differences in hyperparameters, for example. So here we can see 002, 005. Uh, if we compare the scalars, we can see which one did better. Uh, all super easy. Even the debug samples can be uh, compared to each other to see uh, whether or not, for example, this predicted a jackhammer or this one predicted a siren. Both were wrong, but they were wrong differently. So at least you know, right? Um, so this is like the power of an experiment manager, right? Again, all open source and free, so feel free to try it out. Um, this is the whole list. And then the last thing that I want to mention is not only training your models should be an experiment. This is actually why ClearML, why, why ClearML calls it a task instead of an experiment, is because pre-processing and downloading the data should be a task as well, right? Um, because yeah, why not? And then you you have this reproducible stuff, and then you can um, add debug samples or, um, or plots if you want to, right? Okay, let me go back here. So essentially the recap is it's super easy setup. Uh, it's essentially just two lines of code. Um, it's all you need. Mainly, uh, this is like the, the clear melting two lines of code, but there are others obviously, and they, they require very little changes usually as well. Um, but I just would recommend starting with, uh, with any. So we have weights and biases, which is very well known, comets, MLflow, Neptune, Guild, and us, of course. Um, so there, there are a lot of those. Now, there is a second part here. Um, it's reproducibility. So only you know to change your code and reproduce a specific outcome, right? And this is where we go a little farther than what other uh, or like what most experiment managers offer and what I would advise you, you search for anyway, uh, because it is very, very powerful um, tooling. So that's you in the present from two weeks ago or two months ago, you don't know how to change the single parameters, like what cell you had to set to false um, to be able to rerun everything, right? It's, it's hard to keep track of. Um, so it's also difficult to share, which is a thing that most people overlook, but it's very, very handy to be able to just share all of your experiment findings um, or your code to be able to either reproduce it or at least check the output uh, for someone else. 
And then there's remote execution as well. So I think most people in uh, the current day use at least some kind of remote machine, be it in the cloud or on-premise, that actually remotely executes all of their training code, right? Um, but experiments are now reproducible. So we can easily rerun them on any machine. Actually, we can't even we can even do more than just rerun them. We can run them with different parameters, and I'll show you just in a minute how that works. Um, so you can change the parameters and then rerun it remotely because we have using the experiment manager, we actually have all of the information that we need to be able to just set it up on a different machine. We have all the install packages, we have the uncommitted changes. Um, so it's just a package. Essentially, we're building the Docker container for you. That's the that's the main idea and maintaining it as well. Um, so that's a solid workflow, right? So test local, run remotely. Um, what I mean with that is you can actually add a single line of code, task that execute remotely in the command or like in the code, and that will actually run until that command locally, and then it will send it to the cloud or to um, the on-premise machine, basically to a ClearML agent, which is our kind of worker, our remote worker. So I'll show you that how that works. Um, essentially, the, the easiest way to get started with uh, remote machines or like remote execution is actually to take one of the experiments that you already have and just clone it. Um, so let me just clone it. I'll just give it the same name, clone. And now it's in draft mode. And in draft mode, what we can actually do is we can edit the hyperparameters here. So I could just change this to, for example, 0, 01, save it, and then I can enqueue it. And ClearML works with a bunch of different queues. You can make as many of those as you want. And there's workers, remote machines, workers that are actually listening to those queues and that are running it. So as you can see, it now jumped to running because I have a bunch of workers waiting for it. Um, and it is actually outputting the logs in real time here. You can just follow along. And then the scalers, once it actually starts training, should be uh, right there as well. So that's actually a really, really cool thing. And what will happen is because we changed the configuration, what will happen is once ClearML actually detects, oh, I, I know that the argument parser actually had these um, uh, commands or like these uh, arguments, what it will be able to do is just say, okay, you changed this in the UI. I will now inject the value that you changed in the UI into this parameter. And so this parameter, the dropout here, if you would be able to look at it at the moment of runtime, this will be 0 0.1 because I changed it just a minute ago, and it will inject it into the remote machine, which is really, really cool, right? Um, so in that way, you can just automatically redo a model that you've already done or um, add some, change some parameters and, and uh, re, um, like start experimenting, basically. Um, so now it's starting to actually uh, train, and I'm going to uh, zip over to the slides again. Oh, wait, is it just started? Uh, Oh, okay, so for some reason, the um, demo gods are not by my side, of course. Um, so yeah, it gave me an error. I'm sorry about that. Uh, that's always the, the risk with demos, right? Um, but basically, it should be able to uh, quickly run that for you on a different machine. And I'll actually uh, show you what that looks like. So orchestration is another one that is actually easily overlooked. And so many people sharing the same GPU machine uh, with SSH is actually annoying. So an answer to that is queuing. Um, and I'll show you what that looks like. My deadline is coming up, but someone else is hogging the machine. If you've ever heard that, um, what you need is priority queuing, uh, at least queuing that you can change the order of. Um, suddenly, everyone needs to compute at the same time, and limited servers can't handle this. So if you're like at a part of like a small company or you have machines on premises, and suddenly everyone wants to train at the same time, what ClearML and others have as well, but uh, is the auto scaling. And what that means is, the workers that I told you about, they can be run on any machine. So you can also run them um, on the cloud. And we actually have a tool for that, which monitors your queues. And if they're getting full, it just spins up new workers on the cloud and gets you going right away. So you can actually uh, do basically start with nothing if you have no um, compute, or you can do it for overflow protection as well. And then there is some automation stuff. Uh, so for example, we have an HBO app, uh, which can essentially clones the task for you and then changes the hyperparameters for you and then looks at the scalers for you. And essentially it puts the uh, optimization process above your code, like on the task. And it will just look at the task as a black box and just sees the inputs, sees the outputs. I will just schedule it for you. I will actually do that in the queues as well. Uh, we can run pipelines, for example, by chaining together different experiments that we can clone and change the parameters of. 
right? You can actually also do this from straight from code, um, but that's another question entirely. Um, and then schedule jobs, for example, um, triggers or schedulers is also something that is in the um, MLOps um, tool that's called ClearML. So it's essentially a tool box, right? It's just filled with tools that can help you, uh, be it the queues, the workers, the experiment manager, the data versioning system, stuff like that. Um, so again, I will show you what that looks like. I'm uh, pretty annoyed that uh, that it's now not working. I just failed, so I'm sorry about that. Um, actually, I should know why that is, but uh, oh, wait, maybe let me just, I really want uh, want this to work. So if I clone this one, I think I might have cloned the wrong one. Oh, uh, this one. I'll just do that real quick and we'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, I really hope this works though. Right, so I'll enqueue it. Um, actually, I didn't change the parameters this time, but that's that's fine. Um, right, so what that might look like is you have the workers and queues tab here. And as you can see, I have a bunch of um, workers, CPU workers in this case, running on my laptop here. Uh, it can be your own machine, it can be any machine, it can be a cloud machine, doesn't really matter. It's a single uh, command line command to set up one of these workers. Um, and then uh, it will just connect to your to your server. But apart from that, you don't have to do anything. It's a single command to initialize and a single command to start the, the worker. Um, so you can see which of the experiments it's currently running. And that's the one that I just queued, right? So I hope this will work uh, this time. And then you have several workers here. So the others are just waiting, which is fine. Uh, then you have multiple queues. You can make as many of those as you want. And you can just add a new queue here. Um, and then in uh, this case, for example, we have in GPU queue, we have like a bunch of experiments listed. We don't have any workers on there, so nothing is, is happening. Uh, but you can actually take one of these workers and just slide them up and just change the priority entirely. Um, you can also easily uh, look at which workers are working for a specific queue. And you can actually even abort a specific task as well so that the next one in the queue uh, gets it say. So that's the kind of thing that might that it might look like. And then if you go into applications, you have the auto scaler right here. You have the hyperparameter optimization right here. Um, and then for example, pipelines that might look like this. Um, so you have like a different get data, pre-process data model training, but you can just clone model training as many times as you want, right? That's the whole idea. So if you if you clone it three times and then three times you overwrite, for example, the random state, one time 500, one time 420 and one time 20, uh, 42, you just have now created a pipeline that does a little yeah, hyperparameter for you and then just can select the best model. And then if you click here, you get actually, you go to the page of the of the actual best model that for example, is tagged as pipeline winner. So this can actually be very, very powerful um, if, if you dig deep into it, right? Right, so now we get into the, into the deployment stage, right? Uh, this might be a little bit far away, um, but the whole idea is that this is, for people that are really trying to get their model into production, right? That's that's the, the main thing here. Um, so what you could do uh, to get a model repository, so the model repository is like the main thing you want to be building, right? Um, and then what you could do is commit the best model to Git LFS and then version it that way. But like I said, there are better tools for that by now um, because in a separate, uh, so in a separate document, you can keep track of which model is how good. Um, I've seen people do that. That's, I mean, it works if you're diligent, but a lot of people aren't. So there are tools that try to essentially do this for you. They, they, they keep the separate document or like an Excel file for you. Um, so what does that look like? Models are essentially captured by the experiment tracker, right? They're, they're, they're tracked anyway. Um, automatically when you save, for example, a torch model, it's tracked and uploaded. So all the models are already in a list. And if I now go, uh, I'll go back in just a minute. Uh, so they're also in that list, they're fully queryable and organized. You can also just use tags, for example. So imagine if I know that this model is very, very good, I can tag it or I can even automatically tag it based on a threshold and then automatically tag it as, for example, being for production. And then a model serving instance can query that model list and then only get the latest version with that tag. So this is very, very powerful and it's built for you. That's the, the main thing. So let me just show you uh, in just a minute. Actually, I hope. Yeah, so this one completed, it actually worked. Um, I told you it, it, uh, it should work. So yeah, this was essentially just um, worked on by the uh, remote agent, right? So that's really, really powerful um, and, and really cool to work with. Right, so where was I? Um, let me just go back because I lost my train of thought. Yeah, there we go. So um, actually, if you go and see here, you have experiments here, but you also have models. And that's just a list 
of the different models that were captured over time by just running your experiments. And then it's super easy to just say, I want to add a tag, for example, and create a new tag, production, oh, production, add it, and boom, we have one. And then you can actually even make a trigger on that within the system that listens to tags being created on specific data sets or on specific models. And then you can um, add additional logic to that as well. So you're essentially organically building up that model repository, which is very, very powerful. Um, and then there is deployment. So there is ClearML serving. Now, what a lot of people tend to do is wrap their main.py in, uh, inside a Flask API, for example, uh, so other people can call it. They um, use the API to run then a demo on their project website, for example, and then performance is bad because the GPU usage is low, which is usually the most annoying thing because you're like paying for a GPU and you're only using like 20% of it, especially with serving, that's a big issue. Um, and that can get quite expensive. So you can also not easily update the model version, which is a problem when you're using a Flask, for example, or just an API wrapper. Um, you, you can't just hot swap a model. Uh, you can't do canary deployments. It's all not built in. Um, so there, there are downsides to it. There are upsides to it as well. Like it's very, very quick to do. Um, it's very, very nice and, and people know it already, but there are better tools if you're willing to learn about them. Um, and then there is obviously monitoring as well, um, which is, yeah, I if you're using a Flask server, I have no clue if my model is running well. Like I have no clue what kind of data is coming in. I don't know, I have a clue what kind of data is going out. Um, so it's essentially it's debugging in the dark and uh, it's some, uh, sometimes will go wrong. And if something goes wrong, you're just, you're not, you don't have any idea. So you only have the Flask um, output, but that, that, I mean, in most cases, and that's the problem with um, machine learning and why MLOps is such a field, is machine learning doesn't behave just like code, right? So if something goes wrong, it won't crash. It will just output wrong predictions. And that's what you want to catch. So that's why you need monitoring. Um, there is also no user statistics, but they could have been interesting. So just simply from a, a developer standpoint, it might be interesting to know why people are using your app um, and how they are using it. So I will show you the world. Um, unfortunately, ODSC uh, software does not work on Linux. So I, ha I have been forced to uh, set everything up on Windows and I haven't been able to get Docker up uh, fast enough. So essentially it's a Docker Compose up uh, to get started with ClearML serving. The GitHub link is, is right here down below. Um, basically search for Allegro AI and then you should be fine. Um, so essentially you do a Docker Compose up and it sets up a stack for you. And then the idea is that you have a wrapper um, around either NVIDIA Triton, which will do the inference on the GPUs for you, which is a very good serving engine from NVIDIA. And then you have Intel's one API um, and the one API will do uh, serving on the CPU. And if you, then you have a wrapper where you can add custom pre-processing code and then you can just tell it like, hey, I want to use this model from the model repository of ClearML, but you don't have to use it. And that's the point in every single tool that ClearML has is you don't have to use any of the tools if you're using just one of them. If you use the experiment manager, you don't have to use data versioning from ClearML. You can just use data versioning from someone else and then just import the ID, for example, so that there's still a link. Um, and in this case, you can just create an API for a model that isn't trained by ClearML, but it might be interesting to do it that way uh, because you have the model repository that I just showed you. Um, and then this wrapper will essentially just get API requests, send them either through to NVIDIA um, Triton or to the one API, depending on which model and on which accelerator you want to run it on. And then it will also um, pre-process it with your own code, but also capture metrics for you and do all of the monitoring for you. And then you end up with a Prometheus database that has all of the information that you need. And you can just send that through uh, to a Grafana dashboard or to any of the tools that you want to use as a third party. Um, so it's completely open. Uh, you can just yeah deploy it and then um, go from there. It also has Canary deployments, for example. If you go to our YouTube channel, there is actually a pretty um, good talk that I think I recently uploaded. Um, that goes about actually going through the steps of setting this up uh, and then showing you how it works and then go back again. So essentially we, we find drift um, like you can see here, and then we go back and create a new model and then deploy it as a canary endpoint. So if you're interested in that, which might be a little bit too advanced for this uh, talk, but if you're interested in that, feel free to check out our YouTube channel. Uh, it's all on there. 
Right. Uh, so essentially, you just deployed any of the models you trained or any of the uh, models or you already have. I just told you all of this. Uh, and some monitoring is done automatically. Right. There's other tools that do this, of course. So you have the Triton Inference Engine itself, which is what GRML uh, uses to do its uh, serving. Um, there's ML Run, there's Stands for Extended, there's Cell and Core. There are others. Uh, so if you're just interested in this kind of scene, feel free to Google these um, and make your own decisions. But it's always interesting if you drop by our Slack channel just to say why or why not you chose for uh, clear ML serving or not. Uh, because yeah, we're always trying to make these tools better. So yeah, it's always good to have some feedback. Right, so uh, a little bit early, uh, we have a recap. So MLOps is essentially an umbrella term for a set of tools that makes the daily life of a data scientist easier and more efficient. That's, I think, what, what is the no-nonsense version of this and not the marketing version. Uh, so, so the main tools to start with, if you're, if you're not doing that yet, is the connection between data versioning and experiment management. Um, if you just add two lines and then create your data, ver data set versions in the code, it will already be a big, big difference. And then there's orchestration as well uh, using the remote machines that I just talked about, um, which you can then build on top of. So that's, th those are interesting starting points. Um, and then, of course, there's serving, there's pipelines, there uh, is automations as well uh, to check out. So feel free to check out our YouTube channel for that as well. So this is a wrap up. Thank you so, so much. I see three questions here already. So uh, thank you for those questions. I'll just get right back to them. Um, so essentially, if you want to get started, you can go to clear.ml uh, or app.clear.ml if you want to go to the console immediately. Uh, this is the GitHub link. I think this is actually one of the questions. So what is the GitHub link for this demo project? Okay, no. Um, so the GitHub link is to ClearML. I'll just share the GitHub link for the project. Um, there is Slack as well. Uh, if you go to our documentation, there's a link there, or you can go uh, to clearml.slack.com. We have a community of about 1,400 people now. There is several people of our company constantly on there um, to help you. So you will uh, get answers uh, on your questions if you have any. Um, we are also on Twitter. We make the goodest memes, as you might probably have seen. Uh, at ClearML app is where you need to go. Myself is at Victor Sunk uh, or victor.sunk at uh, clear.ml. So try it yourself. It's completely free and open source. Um, we have a SaaS version, which is how we make money. That's usually a question that people ask is, is how can you do this for free? So we have a SaaS version. Um, even actually the server itself, which is like the UI that I showed you, is open source. You can like deploy that locally with the Docker Compose up. Um, or on Kubernetes. So yeah, feel free to give it an, a spin. And then there's also an enterprise version if you're interested uh, to go with your company. Uh, there's like custom features, there's uh, custom applications um, that can be made. So yeah, there's several options there. Um, that's kind of the deal. 